so as I said, my energy was endless and um, I took on all kinds of projects. And then the winter came and I thought, I must have been crazy. How could I take on all those projects? Look, I can barely get through my basic uh, syllabus here or my basic program. And now you've taken on all these other things. What was going on? Together, we go out there. Together, we begin to share. Good to see you here on The Pulse. As you know, I did rebrand my show from Mentorage TV that nobody really could pronounce, sometimes not even me, to On The Pulse. And here we talk to amazing personalities again having really something to say but looking also at the person behind the persona why they do what they do so welcome to on the pulse and we are starting this show with a really big guest well i have invited dr norman e rosenthal he's known in the states as dr norm he is one of the best doctors in America. He was actually named that. He's been practicing psychiatry for almost 44 decades, so 40 years. And he is actually the man behind SAD. And that makes him an incredibly joyous man. And with SAD, I don't mean SAD as in SAD. I mean seasonal affective disorder. He was actually the one once he migrated from South Africa to the US to do his psycho psychiatry training there, that actually was the first one to describe it. Something that was always there, that people get sad when it's winter or it's dark, or maybe it is summer, but they sit in the dark. And not only that, the first description pioneering this, he also pioneered the therapy, bright light therapy. You would not believe how much that can actually make a difference in life quality and mood. And I have to say, Dr. Norm, welcome to the show. I'm super, super honored. You've been featured by Oprah, by ABC, by CNN, by NBC, who I used to work for at CNBC. Uh, Oprah, I think, is extremely close to you. So thank you so much for being here on the show. Well, it's really my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And you know what I love about what I researched about you? Apart from that entire legacy and what you've done in your life, you're still active. You are active as an active professor of psychiatry at Columbia, uh, no, at, at Georgetown, sorry. Columbia is where you went um, as a postgrad at Georgetown, and you're an active life coach. And you coach celebrities, sports people, athletes in general, CEOs, everybody that cannot be affected by a seasonal disorder and needs to keep their wits together. So wonderful. Um Dr. Norm, let's start with the clarification for our audience. What really sad is? What is the essence of um, what you termed primed, made known, and now also help people to overcome? One way of looking at sad is that it's a seasonal rhythm. And seasonal rhythms are common throughout the world. One of my first sad patients said, I should have been a bear because bears are allowed to hibernate and humans are not. A very large percentage, I would say up to 20% of people experience seasonal changes, especially in the northern parts or very far southern parts of the, of the world. And these people who I include myself amongst, which is how I got into the area, feel the changes of the seasons, uh, oftentimes September, October, as the days get shorter, as the light gets lower, we feel uh, a lack of energy, a lack of zest, a lack of drive, and many other symptoms, overeating, oversleeping, just not being our best selves. And that is the beginning of sad. But then for some people, what we realize, it can actually get quite a bit worse. They can begin to fail at their work, in their personal relationships, because they can't engage, they want to withdraw. 
and they can become depressed. So there's a whole spectrum going from just a slight change over the winter, over the autumn and the winter, coming out in the spring, to quite a severe syndrome that can actually disable people. And that is really what seasonal affective disorder, or SAD, is all about. You just mentioned, Dr. Norm, that is something that you actually discovered as well. And I know your first meaningful research paper was really about this this um, syndrome, or you even called it an epidemic, a hidden epidemic. What did it do to you? Did you actually did you actually come to research it because you noticed something within you, or was it something that you actually noticed within your patient that the patients that there was a certain seasonality? I think I could say both. You know, research is such a lot of work that you're not going to invest that amount of energy and work unless you feel it's something that's really worthwhile, and that is. Uh, how I came to seasonal affective disorder because I felt it myself when I came from South Africa to the United States. I felt myself slowing down and less productive. And I thought, what's going on here? It never was like this in South Africa. And so that began my quest. And then I found some people who had it much worse than me and the story came together. But had I not suffered from it myself, I wouldn't have believed it was worth the years of work that research involves to invest in this thing, because at the time it seemed frivolous. I remember one one friend saying to me at a professional meeting, she said, come here and let's stand under the light. I'm already feeling depressed. So she was kind of joking with me because it was the idea was this is ridiculous. Why are you investing this time, this energy in something that is trivial? And it turns out it is not at all trivial. And I think this is so courageous. I love that story because, um, first of all, this triviality, that was one of my questions I had as well. A lot of people brush it off. They just go like, yeah, of course, you know, you feel a bit low because, uh," but they go like, they motor through with whatever strategy. They just either pull through or they eat through or they drug themselves through or whatever it means to be getting through this. How and this teasing, you know, this passive aggression <laughs> that you that you got there from that woman, did that actually? How did you actually find out that it wasn't only you? Did you did you go around and notice it? Notice it um, with other people? What you seem to have felt that they were also less productive during certain months, or did you write out say, hey, every time November comes, guys, you know what? You can put me straight in the bin because I'm useless and I don't know why. Well, firstly, for that colleague who made that joke to me at the meeting, I want to say thank you. I have dined out many times on that story. (laughs) It is a wonderful story, especially (laughs) because it's a woman, which is something that we're going to talk about later on, right? (laughs) But in any event, the, the essence of your question eludes me now. What is the key question that you're asking me here? But the question is really because it is something that society hasn't really termed. You were the first one to term it. You were the first one to actually pull it out of the closet and say, hey, there's something that is not right. And you, everybody brushes it off because just like once dyslexia was something that, yeah, she's just silly, she's stupid. Now it's something that people treat, that people are very sensitive to, especially in children, okay, that you actually had the guts to either raise the flag and even ask around or how did how did that really happen that you found other people enough people that suffered with you well to answer the first part of the question i've always been attracted to things that are in the corners of a picture i always look and see who's in the corners of a picture um, because the center is too obvious and i'm always looking for the unexpected angle. So that is my nature. But the way in which I went about trying to find a large group of people, at that time, you had to get referrals. It was, you know, the kind of British system of you've got to get a referral from a colleague. And I looked around and my colleagues had never seen it, or they thought they had never seen it. But actually, they just, you know, if you don't look, you won't see is the way is the way it works. Um, And 
so I realized I had to go straight to the people themselves. Now, in those days, advertising in a newspaper was like chasing an ambulance. And it was very uh, undignified. But I thought, hey, I'm a researcher. And if I want my subjects, I've got to go that way. And I found a wonderful journalist from the Washington Post who was willing and happy to talk about my experience with these few patients and my hypothesis that this must be, you know, wider and would anybody out there? And I thought, you know, Washington, D.C. area is quite a big area. Maybe I'll get a handful of people, thousands of responses from all over the country. And then I knew I was on to something mm. because, you know, I wasn't dealing with a rare syndrome. I was dealing with a really common problem. And I think people just accepted, you know, the winter because there was nothing you could do about it. Uh, one of one of the quotes in my book says, everyone complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so finally, we had a way of doing something about it. And it was very exciting. No, I think this is wonderful. And it's great to have found a journalist because back then we didn't have social media. Nowadays, Dr. Naomi would just tweet something and all of a sudden you would have, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I got these letters from all over and I opened them up and they were beautiful. One, one, had, a, one had a poem by Emily Dickinson uh, falling out and, and the poem said, there's a certain slant of light, winter afternoons, that oppresses like the heft of cathedral tunes. So these letters were so beautifully written and gave me so much richness. And that's the kind of thing that I put into my writing. Yes, not only into your writing, but into your wonderful poem. I think it's called Poems Rx. We're going to talk about as well, uh, which I think is very interesting, even though the focus of our conversations, of course, your latest book. I think together with the rewrite of uh, or re-editing of Winter Blues, you have authored and co-authored now about 10 books. Am I right? Right? Yeah, yeah. This is my 11th book. 11th and, book. Um, but in this book, it's interesting because I didn't want to rewrite. I didn't want it to sound like anything I'd written before. I wanted it to be completely fresh. And that enabled me to see it with fresh eyes. And I thought, you know, these days people read differently from how they used to read. They want their news, news you can use, and they want it quickly. They don't want long stories. They want short, short little anecdotes. So I've tried to make it very interesting and very informative at the same time without making it a big book. Absolutely, absolutely. I thought also I was holding a tool. This is what it is. This is how you how you assess it. And this is what you're going to do about it. Very, very clear. And you're absolutely right. These days, one can be happy if somebody actually p picks up a book and reads it, reads it from cover to cover, not okay, what can I use here, there and jumps basically from uh, from chapter to chapter. But let's, uh, let's go back a little bit and dive deeper, deeper into what you said right at the beginning, Dr. Norm. And you alluded to um, sad seasonal affective disorder, if not really cared for, picked up on and treated, can develop into something more severe. Um, so one thing is to feel a little bit off mood for whatever reason, not slept, didn't sleep very well, had crappy food the day before, didn't digest, etc. The other thing is to really be affected by changes of clocks, for example. And not looking into it, it seems to me that there's a whole spectrum, 50 shades of gray, of what you could call melancholy, maybe sadness, maybe depression, maybe bipolar disorder. What does it really cover? How severe can it get if one doesn't look into it, doesn't take it seriously, and calls it frivolous? Well, I think... In the bad old days, before we knew about SAD, it was very easy to lose one's footing and stumble. And you know how when you have a little stumble, then you can fall, have a bigger stumble and you can really fall flat on your nose. And that's what a lot of people did. You know, as they began to fail at work, they didn't realize what it was. They would stay at home maybe or underperform. They didn't 
know there were ways to beat it. Their relationships would suffer. And, you know, often the patients were women. So I would hear that they would always lose their relationship, that they would get a relationship in the summer, they would lose the relationship in the autumn, they would be on their own, like a hibernating bear in the winter, and they would find another relationship the next spring. And um, of course, this was a sort of depressing spiral that they were going through up and down. So I think in the old days, and even currently in people who don't really know what's going on, it can get quite severe. But the really great news about it is that there are many things that can be done. Um, and the key insight that I want to really promote in my book is that you need to combine these different things. It's not one thing. You know, people want to seize on one solution. Obviously, it makes it simpler. The light. Give me a light box and I'll walk off into the sunset, so to speak. Yes. But it's really many things. It's, it's your foundational habits of living. It's uh, your cognitions, the thinking, how to sort of fix your thinking. It's behavior. Um, if you you know, uh, huddle up in your room, it's one thing versus, well, I'm going to make a lunch date. I'm going to go out somewhere. I'm going to go hiking. I'm going to go doing something. Because it's one of those conditions that the more you do to help yourself, the better your outcome will be. That's as yes. simple as that. Yes. And you said that the most important word in this book is combine. That was right. your main message, right? Right. Uh, when you when you felt this disorder coming to the States, uh, Dr. Norm, um, I wonder, you know, uh, the natural progression as you were describing it, and women seem to be a little bit more sensitive to men to these kind of seasonal um, sadnesses or winter blues, is that you say, okay, you have to take arms against, you know, um, these negative thoughts, negative feelings, this lacklusterness, this even, you know, like the failure, you're talking about failure of in your in your performance at work, but even the failure to just wanting to move, to say, okay, you should get up, but you're like, I can't. What happened with you? Where, at what point did you say, okay, I need to do something here? And the first step was you started to look, look into it and talk about it. But how did it feel for you where you said this is not normal? Where is the where's the line, the real symptoms where people can say what happened to you? I looked at me and I said, nah, that's not Norman Rosenthal. I don't like this person. Well, it's it's interesting because the way it came to me is that when I came to the States, it was the long days of summer. And in Johannesburg, which is much closer to the equator, the summer days were never so long as they are in New York City. And here I was with these 15, 16, 17 hour days, and my energy was endless. I, I was unstoppable, or so it felt. Excuse me. <clears throat> so as I said, my energy was endless, and um, I took on all kinds of projects, and then the winter came and I thought, I must have been crazy. How could I take on all those projects? Look, I can barely get through my basic uh, syllabus here or my basic program. And now you've taken on all these other things. What was going on? So luckily in the summer, I've got a tremendous amount of energy. And in the winter, I've just got a normal amount of energy. <laughs> Okay, so you're an hyperactive one. So you're just okay in the winter. Get it. Okay. So, but I saw the big, big difference. And then when we started looking into the lights, I got one of these, I got a ceiling fixture because there were no professional light boxes. And I put the ceiling fixture right there in the bedroom, standing up so that the whole room was illuminated. And uh, I saw immediately what an impact it had. And so that really gave me the courage and the conviction that this was a path worth following. Consistency comes to my mind because you say, okay, we have these very long summer days and very short winter days. By the way, I sit in Zurich, Switzerland, 
And I can tell you a very similar story moving here as well. Not necessarily from a more uh, sunny country, but I can very much relate to you. So living closer to the equator, for example, when I'm in Singapore, it's seven to seven, seven to seven. It's really strange. I mean, whatever day of the year, because we are sitting on the uh, equator in Singapore, but it means also we have a fairly level level of energy. And it's actually that inconsistency, that kind of jet lag that we seem to have that messes with our circadian rhythm, with our uh, neurotransmitters, hormones. What is actually going on in the brain and on a hormonal level in the body that causes this, that causes this sadness? Well, it's a great question. Nobody knows for sure, but there are many pointers to certain neurotransmitters like serotonin and melatonin. These are two substances that are very closely related chemically that may have a role in orchestrating seasonal change. Um, remember, if there are if there's a need for animals to reproduce at certain times of year or to be more or less active at certain times of year then the brain evolves to have ways to make that happen and this these mechanisms involve brain neural pathways various portions of the brain regions of the brain and various neurotransmitters and one of the key ones is serotonin but it doesn't act, it's like you go to an orchestra, it's not, you don't have one violin playing, you have the whole orchestra playing. And that's what the neurotransmitters in the brain are like. They're all working in concert with one another. And that means that if that does not happen, our mood shifts because serotonin, as far as I understand, is also being used as part of the therapy when somebody is either feeling low or even slips into depression. What does the light do to us or the uh, deficiency of light do to us that this orchestra is just not A, complete and B, certainly not playing in harmony? Well, a lot of the work has been done on animals. One of the early lines of research is the effects of light on the secretion of melatonin at night. And uh, that was one of the major findings that put us on this path, that light can suppress melatonin in humans. And that has been the way in which animals, all the way down from single cell animals, all the way to humans, interpret the length of the day is by the length of melatonin secretion and that gets influenced by light so that's one pathway but you know the the body is very complicated and the brain is very complicated and it relies on redundant pathways you know imagine if there was some place that you really wanted to go your favorite store your favorite coffee shop imagine if there was only one route to get there you would be in trouble so you know that if there's a, a blockage here you can take this detour and so on and so forth and that's how the brain has evolved that if you need the light for whatever reason there are many different pathways that enable you to understand this is a long day, this is a short day. And right now they're discovering that there is, and this is work done in rats and rodents, that there are pathways whereby the light hitting the eyes has a direct effect on mood. And then there are other pathways which show it has an indirect effect via its influence on daily rhythms and activity cycles and other things. So, um, there are many, many things going on, but we, we haven't got the complete story told yet because it's yeah, too yeah. complicated. But I even, love exactly even that. Even the sunlight on the skin, even the sunlight on the skin has a redundant effect. It causes skin cells to make a compound called beta endorphin that's related to the opiate system. So we need to know when is the light shining? When do we need to go outside to forage for food? And when do we need to crawl back into our cave and go to sleep? 
And all these things have been crucially important in evolution. And that's why there are so many different ways biochemically in the brain, in the skin, in the body to tell us that the season is summer or winter. Yes. We do have to divide, though, between the humans and, let's say, nocturnal animals like hamsters, for example. I mean, uh, just... To say, you know, in, in a personal story, the debate with my daughter was when she was seven or eight, she wants a hamster. And I said, well, hamsters die every three months because they get a heart attack. Why do they get a heart attack? Because you want to play with them during the day when they want to sleep and then they're hyperactive during the night. So I think there we also have to um, divide a little bit the, you know, living things, humans that do react positively to to the light and that makes them active and vice versa. So there's there's nuances there. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're a, we're a diurnal species and we have a very different physiology from our nocturnal relatives, the rats. The, the rats, we're not rats. Um, let me just follow your thought on what you were saying, that um, light exposure changes our mood. And um, I wonder, you know, I have a very dear friend here, and she's the mother of one of um, Victoria's schoolmates, now the IB is done, ex-schoolmates. And I tell you, Dr. Norm, talking about somebody having that, she was the best of the best of the best, active, done, fun when the sun is out. The moment it's cloudy, bad weather, rain or snow and it's a gray day, you cannot talk to that person. It's like two different people. And she really makes other people feel she's in a bad mood. And that brings me to the next question. As you were saying, we are very complicated. Light affects us, sunlight even more. But because we are affected, if we don't treat it, we never live in a vacuum. That becomes a social, you call it uh, epidemic, okay, or pandemic almost. But this can be really also socially disruptive. Apart from not being able to do your own work, what happens to your human relationships? You become more, what, just not nice? Well, I think they become more impoverished. You know, we... We don't have the energy to tell our friend the latest thing that happened or ask our friend, you know, what's going on with so-and-so, your wife, your husband, they were ill, how are they doing? Um, all the energy required for good social connections requires that you be engaged and that you be up, you know, it, to, to pay a sick visit to somebody or to go and celebrate somebody's birthday or anniversary with them or whatever. Um, let's go out. Let's go to dinner with our friends. We haven't seen them in a while. That takes initiative. That takes energy. Come on, let's have them over to dinner. Why don't we go to co for, for coffee together? Whatever these engagements um, or in the work sphere, you know, I'm going to write a new book. I, I'm going to go on an adventure. I want to travel to such and such a place. All of these energetic, innovative, um, initiating actions require this kind of energy and zest that goes to sleep if you've got SAD or SAD. And so your life becomes impoverished. You haven't seen your friend for a while. You just don't have the energy to, to make love, to get together with people, to go out dancing, to have a picnic. All the things that make love, uh, make life, make love, give, give color to our existence seem to bleach out to the gray, dark colors of winter. I love the way you put it so much because it is so, so true and really counterintuitive if you think about it. If you feel low, the first thing, and you feel kind of like impoverished, as you say, the first thing you want to do is cuddle up to somebody, be hug, get the oxytocin going, the happy hormone, serotonin, etc. And there are, there are, you know, therapies even with that. And I think as you were saying, you know, women, and, and you have to please tell us why women seem to be a little bit more of a vi victim of SAD, um, why we tend to then just cut off maybe that relationship that whilst we are 
lacking energy could give us energy whilst we are lacking happy hormones with a wonderful evening making love waking up the next morning full of happy hormones still men fall asleep women are awake <laughs> all night and do whatever it is you know so happy it happened um why does this make sense that we act exactly counter to what we need maybe on a hormonal level and we withdraw rather than going okay it might take me some energy but it's good for me to socialize it's good for me to go out it's good for me to make love and be physically close to people yeah i think that's a great question why women and i think it relates to the female reproductive biology that somehow through the course of evolution the seasonal cycles have gotten intertwined with the fertility cycle and which makes sense because throughout the animal kingdom uh, it works for animals to have their young when there's a lot of food around and when the weather is warm and when they're more likely to survive because there's going to be food around and it's not going to be too cold so melatonin has been one of the biochemical keys that has hooked up the reproductive cycle with seasonal cycles. And I think in humans, even though we have artificial light, this connection has persisted. And that's why I think women experience it more than men. Men do not have to the same extent the seasons connected with their reproduction and their activity. You know, they needed to be hunting all year round. They couldn't, you know, sit in the cave and be pregnant or whatever it is takes to keep the species going. Um, so I think it, it harks back to that. Now you might say, well, nowadays, you know, we've got central heating and women can do just what men can do, but we haven't completely divorced ourselves from our biological heritage. Absolutely. And we see it in the obesity crisis, for sure, for example. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting one because you wrote a very interesting book, uh, The Emotional Revolution, um, where you talk about the emotions of male, you know, the entire of, of men uh, and their male story about dealing with emotions and expressing them. But let's come a little bit back to the effect of light, because I wonder, you know, there's um, Professor um Andrew Huberman from Stanford University. He has, you know, Huberman Lamb. He's become a very interesting um, podcaster as well, apart from his teaching. And he looks very much into what light can do to your body. And he talks in some of his podcasts about light, light, light exposure. And that is a big, big uh, chapter in your book, talking about the light therapy, the BLT, bright light therapy. Um, and you talk about it needs as, to be as bright as 10 lux, and lux is the measurement. 10,000 lux. 10,000 10, lux, of course, 10 lux is nothing. 10, thank you for that. Now, why is the intensity so important for remedy? Well, it's just a dosage effect, you see. Starting from the very beginning, when we thought that melatonin was not suppressible in humans by light. We just weren't using enough light. When we raised the level of light, then melatonin got suppressed. And that made us realize that in humans, the threshold for light having biological effects was higher than in other animals. And so uh, that's just how we're built, that our retinas and our brains don't respond to low levels of light in the same way as rats or other animals do. And so it's just that discovery. Why did it happen like that? Um, I don't know, probably evolution, uh, that we wanted to really distinguish between day and night um, and not, you know, we didn't evolve with low-level artificial light. I suppose when fire came along, that was the beginning. But um, we didn't evolve that way. We evolved with responses to light of a strength that's equivalent to sunlight. So if we want to reproduce the effects of sunlight, we have to use brighter light. But very importantly, 
Light that's too bright can damage the eyes. And that's why it's so important to use just the right kind of light. And in the book, I do go into details of the various kinds of lights that are available and which ones I have found to be most effective and others through their research have found to be most effective. And uh, it's so exciting that this is now a treatable problem that what was an epidemic that wasn't even recognized can now be recognized, treated, and you can live well all year round. You know, um, my subtitle of the book is a guide to health and happiness through all seasons. And that's what it is. It's, it's not just beat the seasonal affective disorder. It's how do we live well through all the seasons? How do we be healthy? How do we be happy? What is the role of sleep? What is the role of good, good diet? How does meditation come into the picture? These are all things that I like to weave into the solution because basically I live by all of those things. I don't write anything that I don't do myself. Um, and so that's why I, I've learned about it through my academic work, but I've learned about through it through my patients and most of all through my own experience. Yeah, and you still do it. I've been uh, also researching you and your podcast uh, as well. And there was one where even you, you, during the podcast you had one of your lights on, and it seemed that you use you really put your money where your mouth is what you preach you do and not only because you try it out but because it is a lifestyle and i think this is what this combine being the most important magic word but the holistic approach to treatment in general i think you know the system approach to medicine is something that is a lot i think a lot more effective anyway than the classical medicine yes you do need surgery etc but if it comes for comes to the well-being you're talking about, you do have to have a holistic approach. Talk to me then a little bit about sleep. You touched on melatonin, which is very, very important, which goes down with age. And I have to say, I'm taking melatonin at night before I go to sleep because I started waking up at about 3 a.m. in the morning, which was slightly too, I'm, I'm an early bird, but 3 a.m. is stretching it even for me a bit. How, how that actually impacts everything you do, disrupted sleep, and how also the exposure to the bright light therapy can regulate this. And not only in winter, but also in summer, which is something I learned through your book, that you can have SAD also during summertime. Well, I think when we talk about the importance of light, we also need to remember the importance of dark because we sleep well in a room that's like a cave, dark, cool, quiet, no bats. Um, I, I think that that's the one side of sleep. And then it's nice when we wake up to wake up to the light. And in my own bedroom, for example, I, I have a, a light dimmer that I can start turning on the lights a little bit. And then I go to the windows, I open the curtains, I look at what kind of a day is it. And then I turn on some bright lights if it's the winter time. And all of a sudden, it's like a palace of light. And so it's like a morning ritual. You know, they have a, a yogic um, asana called Surya Namaskar, which means I search for the sun, I greet the sun, because there's a sense, and this is where a kind of mindfulness comes in. We want to be pegged into our natural environment, and dark and light are part of that. And so every day just becomes a celebration of the cycling of the earth and the light and the dark. And uh, so it is uh, just a way of celebrating being alive and at the same time benefiting from the biological effects of these natural principles. I absolutely love it because most people talk about a sleeping ritual. 
you know, what do you need to do to prime yourself for good sleep? And there are very many tools. But it's the first time I heard that mm -hmm. one has a morning ritual other than TM. And I do. I've been doing TM for the past, what, 20 years. I love it. I don't get, I have to admit, not twice a day to my 20 minutes, but once a day, I try to make this happen. And once I do have a morning ritual, um, it's a bit more, let's put it this way, more brutal than you <laughs> So I, you know, when I wake up, I pull up the, the the blinds or what have you. I go to the bathroom. I put on the brightest light. Go like, right, I'm awake. I go straight into a cold shower to wash off the night. So I make I make a you know slant, 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 slant. You're awake now. Got it, buddy. <laughs> so I'm a little less. I'm a bit more soothing at night. Simply because there I'm like, oh my God, my husband's like putting on the line. I'm thinking, you can't do that. You will wake up again and brush your teeth before we watch television. And you can just drop off to bed straight away. You don't have to go to the bathroom anymore. But I think this morning ritual to also invite the light, invite the life, you know, slowly and kind of embrace it sets you up very differently. Well... I have yet to try the cold showers. You go. For I it. was I was in the <laughs> South African military many years ago, and we had to do these cold showers every morning, and that cured me of that particular <laughs> treatment. Well, then we have to talk about your trauma, Doctor Norman. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that's traumatic. I think if you your, have to, your podcast know. is not long enough to cover that topic. <laughs> oh yes, it is. <laughs> we just make it as long as it takes. No, but I think you know with the with the cold showers, it's you know talking about mood shifters, what what a lot of people engage in, and you alluded to it before in our conversation, where because you feel low uh, in mood, low of energy, you go for the wrong stuff. You withdraw, maybe you withdraw with a pack of crisps or some uh, other sweets. You kind of do the comfort eating, anything that gives you energy and puts you in this oh my god hibernating mood, and literally you start putting on the weight to hibernate. Um, talking about a mood shifter, you want to feel good about yourself, you breathe out, Wim Hoffman, you breathe out longer than you breathe in, and you just go under the shower and you say, I love it, I love it, I love it. You do that for a few times, and then you cannot have a warm shower anymore. I swear to you, I've been doing this now for three years. People call me mad, but I know. But I I'm, go I'm going to do it, and I will get back to you and tell you whether I agree uh, or not. Please do, please do. Okay. How long do you have to stand in the shower? Oh, no, no. That you see there, I think personal is very important. There you have to totally listen to your body. And there are some that go like cold turkey when they uh, want to go to get off um, a drug. Uh, they go full turkey as in you just stand in the shower until you shiver. I cannot do it. So I've always been doing cold showers, but you know, like starting from the feet, knipe kind of therapy. For my immunity system, I've been doing this for all of my life. Since actually, I had to do it since I'm seven. My mom had to spray me because I was a little bit sickish. So, and then you just do it part by part, and then you do it as short as you can, and as long, uh, as short as you have to, and as long as you can. And you will see. At least with me, it was. It feels like, you know, what it is is this perverse kind of pain enjoying the pain but because it's pain you feel alive it's like those people that kind of mutilate themselves just to have some sort of emotion i don't want to go all the way into that spectrum because that's harmful that's very difficult to treat as well however the showers have a little bit of this because boy you awake and boy you do suffer and you come out and you go like oh i did it and it's your kind of, it's also psychologically your first win of the day it's your first win of the day, and it sets you I'm up. I'm going so. to try it. I love it. I love it. You see, I, I okay, thank you. Okay, but let's not get off track. Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about your, you, your wonderful life and work again. Um, we've been talking about women being a little bit more susceptible to SAD. What about kids? What about college students? I know you've written a few articles about guys out there at college. You need to perform. Please 
take symptoms seriously. Can you tell us a little bit why you you felt you had to you had to look at that area as well? Well, college students are an important group. They are susceptible, but they tend to sleep in in the morning. And so they miss out on the morning light. They also miss out on the parental supervision that they've been getting at home. So it's a bad con uh, combination. It's a bad um, convergence of lack of supervision and lack of morning light. So that's often why they tend to get SAD and a lot of work suddenly piled onto them. They're not used to having to meet their deadlines without any parental supervision. And it's a bad scene. And that's why they're likely to get sad. Mm, literally so. You know, I, I was thinking about my own daughter just now and how different of a circadian rhythm we actually have. I'm a total early bird and she is not necessarily, but teenagers don't tend to be, as you were saying there, they, you know, they, they seem to still be growing or just need that morning mm. sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I really feel she suffers pain when, you know, the light is switched on or when no. the first, yeah, first 10 minutes at breakfast, she's like a zombie. I swear to you, Dr. Norm. And I'm like, da, 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 I'm a radio, I'm switched on, dee, 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 but I go into zombie mode as of 6 p.m. in the afternoon. No, but you know what I mean? so different. How does that really prime us or not to become more or less of a victim of experiencing SAD? Well, I think part of it depends on when she's gone to sleep the night before. Teenagers like to push the night and so that when you come to wake your daughter, she may not have had her quota of sleep. So she may still be very tired. And if you wake up a hibernating animal, for example, they don't like it. They bite. And so I think that may be part of the issue. All right. I've been already taking a lot of time of you, Dr. Norm. So we talked about what is sad, what is the difference to the depression, what we can all do about it. Uh, and basically, that is a holistic approach. Tell me, what are the three main things you would say people should observe in themselves to um, auto-diagnose themselves that they are prone to SAD and should actually do something about it? What are the three key things? The first piece of advice is take your feelings seriously. If you're feeling low, and not yourself and different from how you felt last week, last month, ask yourself what's going on here and consider the possibility that it may be the change of seasons. And if it is that you have found yourself every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, every New Year being in low spirits compared to other people, think about that as a sign that you may have SAD and take heart and comfort in the fact that there are so many things you can do about it. And then set about trying to find out about it, and what you can do and how you can be better. And, you know, there's so many sources of information. One is my own website, which I would encourage people to check out. I put a lot of effort in trying to make it useful and helpful. NormanRosenthal.com, my new book. Um, Defeating Sad is another resource that represents four decades of experience with this condition. And um, I just love hearing from people and I love engaging with people and helping in any way I can. And it is very, very powerful. Your website is wonderful. And you are one of those very few, very prolific, let's say, in in your field that is actually inviting, that is not snobbing, snubbing people, but you invite, you still listen to the market. So thank you very much for this book. Thank you very much for the previous 10 other books you authored and co-authored. And most importantly, Dr. Norm, thank you so much for being with us here on The Pulse. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, my my dear audience. Um, it was an absolute uh, amazing book. I read more than one books. I have the list also uh, below this video for you. Please hook up with uh, Dr. Norman Rosenthal if you feel a little bit off because it's not worth it. Stay energetic, stay curious, stay on the pulse and see you next time. Bye. Together, we'll go out there.
together, we begin to share together, we find our way.